Okay, thank you again for joining us here at Kelly for Something's in the Air, a webinar on monitoring the air we breathe for optimal health and productivity. We are joined today with our presenter, Don Adams. Don is a senior product manager with Kelly and spends a lot of time uh, and focus around um, sensing equipment that is used in maintaining healthy um, indoor air environments. So, Don, um, go ahead. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we want to talk about monitoring the air we breathe for optimal health and productivity. Um, gas sensing today, it, due to government regulations, legislation, governing body standards, and elevated environmental consciousness, is helping to fuel a large growth segment in our industry. That growth segment is gas sensing. Today, buildings don't have the loose specs they once did, and they are buttoned up pretty tight, so to speak, with little or no air leakage. So emphasis on control and energy savings is, is very prominent. So with us as occupants, it's important that we know what we are breathing, and in doing so, maintain the healthiest indoor environments we can. So today, we want to talk about uh, five things, basically. Uh, what gases do we commonly measure? How do gas sensors work? What are some of the issues that affect installation? What about all those approvals and certifications, common questions, and special applications? So which gases do we commonly measure? Today we want to look at CO2, which is carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, VOCs, ammonia, combustible gases, hydrogen sulfide, oxygen, and nitrogen. Let's first talk about CO2. CO2 is the most common gas that any building engineer or owner will monitor and regulate. We use it as an indicator to make sure we are bringing enough fresh air inside the building for the level of occupancy we have a demand for. The more human activity, the more CO2 that is produced. Every time we take a breath or drive our cars, we are filling the air around us with CO2. CO2 levels in the atmosphere rise and fall slightly with the season. In the spring and summer when vegetation is growing, CO2 is absorbed by plants and the ambient levels actually shrink slightly. In the fall and winter when plants are dormant, ambient CO2 levels increase slightly as they are not readily absorbed by plants in their dormant state. While we can't see it in the air, we have seen CO2 in its, its visible solid form, and we know that more as dry ice. Common sources of CO2 are people, breathing, existing, uh, cars, uh, uh, even volcanoes are a source of CO2, uh, forest fires, any kind of combustion that takes place is a source of CO2 in this earth. It occurs naturally and is everywhere. Ambient levels of CO2 hover around 0.04% or more, as we know more commonly, as 400 parts per million. Inside buildings, we generally regulate CO2 to a level of 1,000 parts per million. Apart from an indication of proper ventilation levels, CO2 levels, if elevated and left uncontrolled, can lead to health issues. What are the effects of increased levels of CO2? Too much CO2 can have an effect on productivity. Um, normally, we want to set our, our control points of CO2 around 0.1% uh, or 1,000 parts per million. CO2 levels that approach 1% uh, or 10,000 parts per million can lead to drowsiness, and 5% levels can lead to shortness of breath, dizziness, and also panic attacks. Large concentrations of CO2 reduce the amount of, o of oxygen and thereby induce health issues in the workplace. CO2 is not as critical to human safety as carbon monoxide is. So let's talk about carbon monoxide. Now, we've all heard stories about people um, suffering ill effects from carbon monoxide or having a heater on and, or uh, trying to stay warm in a car in the wintertime. Um, carbon monoxide is another closely monitored, monitored gas and is extremely toxic. Below 35 parts per million, there is really no cause for concern. However, many places are measuring, parts, measuring CO in parts per million as low as 25 parts per million. And in some countries overseas, I have seen specs that are low as nine parts per million. 
It is produced for human activities such as combustion processes in cars, but also occurs naturally, naturally through the processes of the atmosphere and also in volcan volcanoes, wildfires, and other events. So what's all the fuss? CO, carbon monoxide, is a very poisonous gas, and the consequences can be absolutely tragic. Who hasn't heard of someone being overcome with carbon monoxide, and the result oftentimes has been death? It is especially important around loading docks, or wherever there are cars and trucks idling, and also around boilers and furnaces. It is even more critical if building intake air ducts are situated around these places. We usually measure gases like CO and CO2 in terms of parts per million, and it, we measure it in terms of PPM, but that's parts per million. So why is CO so important to monitor? Consider this. The concentrations of CO at 100 parts per million will induce headaches, fatigue, and shortness of breath. If we, if we breathe CO, carbon monoxide, in, in levels of 400 parts per million, we can suffer with severe headaches, fatigue, nausea, dizziness, confusion, and can be life-threatening after just three hours of exposure. Elevate that same, elevate the carbon monoxide concentrations to 1,500 parts per million in an environment. It has all the symptoms that we previously talked about, plus the potential for collapse and death within an hour. So we can see that, that compared to carbon dioxide, it takes very, very little carbon monoxide to have an, an ill health effect on us. So we can easily see why it is very, very important to monitor carbon monoxide whenever there is a combustion process taking place. Well, let's talk about nitrogen dioxide. This is the third gas we'll talk about today. Nitrogen dioxide is a pollutant most associated with diesel engines and other combustion processes. It is typically measured in ranges of less than 10 parts per million. It can have a health impact if not properly monitored. As little as four parts per million can anesthetize the nose, creating a chance for overexposure. It is toxic, but it can be detected by smell and avoided, as most of us do. When we smell diesel fumes, we don't generally stay around and breathe it in. We kind of move to a spot where we don't smell it, so it kind of naturally lets us know that it's around, unlike carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. It is important to monitor for nitrogen dioxide around loading docks and anywhere diesel engines are likely to idle for long periods of time. It is especially important if loading docks are located near building intake air ducts. The next gas I'd like to talk about today is, is VOCs. These are volatile organic compounds. Now, we've all gone shopping for new cars. And we that's an exciting time, and we, we get to pick the car we want, pick the color, and pick the options. But the, the thing people talk about the most is that new car smell. Well, that new car smell is actually you're smelling VOC. That's the vapors from the from the products from manufacture, like the, the carpeting, the plastic that's used in the cars, the paint on the cars. That's all from VOC. The EPA says VOCs are emitted by a wide array of products numbering in the thousands. Examples include paints and lacquers, paint strippers, cleaning supplies, pesticides, building materials, and furnishings like carpet and desk and wood and, and things with varnish on them. Uh, office equipment such as copiers and printers all give off VOCs. Correction fluids, carbonless copy paper, graphics, and craft materials including glues and adhesives permanent markers, and photographic solutions. If you're a little older like I am, you remember the old mimeograph machines and the smell they used to emit. Those are all VOCs. Organic chemicals are widely used as ingredients in household products. Paints and varnishes and wax all contain organic solvents, as do many cleaning, disinfecting, cosmetic, degreasing, and hobby products. Fuels are made up of organic chemicals. All of these products can release organic compounds while you're using them, and to some degree, when they are stored. While VOCs are not acutely toxic, they, they have associated health effects. Health effects from VOCs can include eye, nose, and throat irritation, headaches, loss of coordination, nausea, damage to the liver and the kidneys and the central nervous system. But how do they impact building designs today? 
we monitor VOCs for the abnormal occurrences. That's one of the applications. If you have, if you, if you use a VOC transmitter and you're monitoring and you have a level that's normal, and we suddenly see we have a spike in a VOC transmitter, that tells us that an event has occurred. It could be a chemical spill. It could be a cleaning fluid spill. It could be um, someone's they're, they're installing new carpet. But what it can do is it can clue us and, and tell us to go investigate what has just happened, what caused that spike in our transmitter. It could be something very, very innocent, or it could be something that needs our immediate attention. Either way, we want to make sure our indoor environments are free from irritants for the people inside for the greatest amount of productivity. VOCs play a large role in lead certifications. Indoor concentrations can be up to 10 times higher than outdoor concentrations. And as I mentioned before, typically today we monitor for the sudden changes from the established norm. So let's talk about ammonia. Ammonia is primarily used as refrigerant in commercial applications and industrial applications. And we all know the bottle of ammonia we buy from the grocery store, and it has a harsh and a pungent smell to it. The main concern with ammonia is the adverse health effects. According to the Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety, ammonia gas is a severe respiratory tract irritant. It has a, it has a distinct smell from as little as 0.6 parts per million to 53 parts per million. At concentrations as low as 24 parts per million after two to six hours exposure, there is a noticeable nose and throat irritation. At 500 parts per million, immediate and severe irritation of nose and throat occurs. Brief exposure to concentrations above 1,500 parts per million can cause pulmonary edema, a potentially fatal accumulation of fluid in the lungs. The symptoms of pulmonary edema, tightness in the chest and difficulty breathing, may not develop for 1 to 24 hours after exposure. Numerous cases of fatal ammonia exposure have been reported, but actual exposure levels have, been, have not been well documented. Long-term respiratory system and lung disorders have been observed following severe short-term exposure to ammonia. People repeatedly exposed to ammonia may develop a tolerance to the irritating effects after a few weeks. Tolerance means that higher levels of exposures are required for to, for, to produce effects earlier seen at lower concentrations. It is both caustic and a health hazard. It is lighter than air, so our sensors need to be placed higher on the wall. It is more dominant as an industrial refrigerant, more commonly known as R717. Most home household ammonia, as we know it, is about 5 to 10% ammonia by weight, but used commercially, it contains no water and is called anhydrous ammonia. Can ammonia hurt your eyes? It absolutely can. As exposure increases, Concentrations above 50 parts per million or less for less than five minutes have been found not to have much impact, but as levels increase, levels of irritation increase accord, accordingly until we reach 700 parts per million, where ammonia has been found to have an immediate and a severe irritating effect. We should always wear eye protection as direct contact with liquefied gas can cause frostbite and corrosive injury to eye and permanent eye damage, and even blindness could result. In some cases, a complete loss of vision has been reported. So apart from the smell, and I, and I don't know how many people could stand and, and smell 1,500 parts per million for very long, but apart from the smell, this is a very dangerous chemical, and it has a, a huge impact on our health if, um, if exposed for very long uh, portions of time. Well, let's talk about combustion. Mainly we'll talk about methane, uh, which is the, the prime uh, component of natural gas. We'll talk about propane, and we'll talk about hydrogen. When we talk about measuring or sensing natural gas, we use a methane sensor. Methane makes up a large part of natural gas. When we use these combustibles, we want to be extremely watchful and sensitive to enclosed areas. If a leak does occur, it is easy for levels of gas to build up unaware if we aren't monitoring for these gases. When we talk about combustibles of any kind, we have to talk about the fire triangle. It perfectly illustrates the relationship of the three necessary ingredients that must be present to produce a fire, and they must be in the proper amount. 
this is where the conversation about LEL or the lower explosive limit comes in and the UEL, the upper explosive limit, comes in. The LEL is an acronym for lower explosive limit and simply stated is the lowest concentration of a combustible gas available with oxygen that is capable of producing a fire in the presence of a ignition source. Concentrations lower than the LEL are considered too lean to burn and therefore do not pose a danger. But it is important that we, under, that we monitor the level of these combustible gases as they approach the LEL. Whenever a gas sensor is ordered for a combustible gas, it has to be ordered specifically for the gas that we're monitoring. Let's take methane, for example. Its combustible range is between 4.4% and 17% by volume in air. Below the 4.4% concentration it is a gas that is too lean to burn. And above the 17% concentration, it is too rich to burn. Likewise, the propane is combustible between 2.1% by volume in air and 10.1% by volume in air. But let's look at hydrogen. Comparatively, the ranges for methane and propane are relatively narrow compared with hydrogen. We can see that hydrogen is much more easily combustible as it has a much wider range of combustibility. What do these mean? Let's take methane. A transmitter measuring natural gas may be reading 12 milliamps. What that is telling us is that the concentration of methane is present by 50% by volume of what it would take to ignite a fire in the presence of oxygen. In other words, it's 2.2% by volume in the localized atmosphere. If this level would begin to increase, action would need to be taken to prevent the possibility of fire and taken quickly. But the flip side of that is that concentrations over 17% would theoretically be too rich to burn, but would present other dangers and would potentially be just as hazardous. Hydrogen sulfide. <clears throat> this is a very poisonous and it is a flammable gas. It has a noticeable smell to it. It smells like rotten eggs. It is heavier than air, so any kind of sensor would be, would be mounted closer to the floor. And it is mainly found in areas where sewer gas may be present. It is highly toxic, and as I said before, it is flammable. It has explosive limits of 4.3% to 46%. Being heavier than air, it tends to accumulate at the bottom of poorly vented spaces. That's because it, it's a, that's important because it tells us where we need to mount the transmitter, close to the floor. Although very pungent at first, it quickly deadens the sense of smell, so potential victims may be unaware of its presence until it is too late. Exposure to lower concentrations can result in eye irritation, a sore throat, a cough, nausea, shortness of breath, and fluid in the lungs. Long-term low-level exposure may result in fatigue, loss of appetite, headaches, irritability, poor memory, and dizziness. The relatively low concentration of 0 .00047 parts per million is the recognition threshold. threshold that we first are able to smell it. It is the, it is the concentration at which 50% of humans through a study can detect the characteristic odor of hydrogen sulfide normally described as resembling a rotten egg. Let's look at these health effects and, and how much, what little it takes to, to affect us. Less than 10 parts per million has an exposure limit of eight hours per day. 10 to 20 parts per million is the borderline concentration for eye irritation. 50 to 100 parts per million leads to eye damage. At 100 to 150 parts per million, the sense of smell is clear, and with it, the sense of danger. At 320 to 530 parts per million, it leads to pulmonary edema and the possibility of death. At 530 to 1,000 parts per million, it causes strong stimulation of the central nervous system and rapid breathing, leading to, leading to a loss of breathing. 800 parts per million is the lethal, lethal concentration for 50% of humans for five minutes exposure. Concentrations over 1,000 parts per million can cause immediate collapse with loss of breathing, breathing even after inhalation of a single breath. While certain bodies, well, certainly different bodies react to different levels of, H, of H2S, hydrogen sulfide, it is clear that hydrogen sulfide is a gas we don't want to risk breathing. 
once we get that first whiff, the best strategy is to find an exit strategy. Let's talk about nitrogen. Before we talk about nitrogen, let's talk about oxygen. The thing of oxygen is different in that while we might monitor CO and CO2 and H2S and, and combustibles for their presence and their, and their accumulation, we monitor oxygen for its deprivation. Oxygen is the most chemi abundant chemical element by mass on our planet. High concentrations of oxygen promote rapid combustion. It is interesting to note that oxygen is not the fuel in such fires, but is only the agent to promote the combustion. If you remember, if, if, you're, if you're as old as I am, you remember the Apollo 1 crew that was killed by an oxygen promoted fire. Normally, the atmosphere is made up of concentration of oxygen of about 20.8%. It is a part of our everyday lives, and it is everywhere. Our concern is not that we will encounter too much oxygen, but rather, that, but rather than an event will occur that will deprive us of oxygen. Most transmitters will read normal levels of O2 around 17.3 milliamps for current, for current uh, milliamp types of oxygen transmitters. Our concern of decreasing levels of oxygen is fueled by concern that a leak of some type has occurred, and the oxygen we breathe is being displaced by heavier gas that is driving it out of our breathing space. Oxygen, if you remember by the fire triangle, is a critical part of that fire triangle. And as I said, it constitutes about 21% of our air by volume. Most transmitters we have will measure a range of about 0 to 25%. Part, uh, 25%. And as I said, that it occurs naturally at about 21%. It is used in areas where other gases, such as refrigerants, will deplace the oxygen and therefore take our ability to breathe away. So it is very important that we monitor these oxygen levels. So now let's talk about nitrogen. Nitrogen is a different class of gas. It is an inert gas. It is different, and in that it is inert, meaning it doesn't react with other elements. It's used as a refrigerant commercially, and then the danger it poses to occupied spaces is oxygen displacement. The same would hold true with helium, as it is used as a refrigerant as well. The proper way to monitor for N2 or helium leaks is through the use of an O2 detector, an oxygen detector. So this is how we would, there is no, there is no direct detector for nitrogen. So why would we, so why couldn't we find the nitrogen detector? Why is there not one available? There are no methods of detecting nitrogen. There are some, excuse me, there are some methods of detecting nitrogen, but they are quite expensive and not practical for common HVAC applications. The use of a, graph, a gas chromograph can be very effective and very accurate, but they are also very, very expensive, costing tens of thousands of dollars. Especially when you take that and compare it to something like an oxygen sensor that may sell for up to between a thousand or two thousand dollars. It makes much more sense to use an oxygen sensor to measure the level of oxygen rather than trying to spend an enormous amount of money trying to actually detect the levels of nitrogen. Nitrogen is different, and in order for, nit for a sensor to work, it has to be compared to another substance. Nitrogen is an inert gas, so it won't react with other normally used substances in, in gas transmitters, and for most infrared sensors, nitrogen is a reference gas that is used to measure the other gases. And so measuring varying concentrations becomes difficult. So there is no over explicit nitrogen gas detector that is common for HVAC applications. So let's look at some sensor technology. There are basically three that are being used today, electrochemical, solid state, and infrared. Let's look at electrochemical technology first. Electrochemical sensors operate by reacting with the target gas and produce a signal proportional to the level of gas concentration. The various components of electrochemical sensors depends on the intended gas that we are trying to sense. Because of their design, they have a finite life and must be replaced according to the manufacturer of the sensor. Generally, there is a three-year life expectancy associated with electrochemical sensors, but advancements in technology and, and environmental conditions may lengthen or shorten that lifespan. Usually with electrical chemical sensors, there's a burn-in time associated with each one of those. Once the burn-in time is complete, the sensor will read accurately, and each manufacturer will specify the burn-in time for each of those sensors. 
Electrochemical sensors are not usually affected by atmospheric pressure changes, but can be affected by temperature changes, and usually have some kind of temperature sensor, uh, temperature compensation built into them. Let's look at solid state technology. Solid state sensors are gas specific sensors as well. They typically feature a longer life because they're they're sensing uh, material is not consumed as as it oxidized as it senses the material. Um, lifetimes can last 10 years or more for solid state sensors. They are, however, susceptible to interference from other gases, but filter technology typically minimizes this effect. They are typically less expensive than EC sensors, electrochemical sensors, and are extremely versatile and can be manufactured to detect a wide range of gases. The next gas we'd like to look at is, is infrared technology. Infrared technology is gas specific. It's reliable and repeatable. And uh, they are very versatile. They operate best in stable envi environments and have a long life expectancy. The internal sensing parts of, a, of an IR uh, infrared technology do not come in contact with the detected gas. And the parts that do can be treated and protected from corrosive gases. These sensors are ideal for toxic and combustible gas monitoring applications. The number of applications is virtually unlimited, and it's very versatile. There are two types of infrared, dispersive and non-dispersive. Dispersive has been around for a very, very long time, and, and, it, it, and it describes what happens inside the sensor, that light is dispersed and scattered in different directions. And a sensor is positioned to read that part of the spectrum that applies to the gas that is being measured. Non-dispersive infrared technology uses filters to only let that part of the spectrum through to the sensor of the gas that is being detected. Non-dispersive non technology is newer, much newer than dispersive technology, and it operates in a stable environment and has a long life expectancy. Let's talk about calibration and maintenance. I skipped ahead of slide. I apologize. Let's talk about sensor location. We just talked about the different types of gases, and we talked about the different types of technologies that are used to create the sensors, the transmitters, that sense those different types of gases. It's important that we mount the gas, the, the gas sensing transmitters in the proper place. Gases are either going to be heavier or lighter than air, and we want to position them so that they detect the gases as quickly as possible. So for instance, carbon monoxide is going, to, is going to be a little heavier, so we want to mount it three to five feet from the floor and at about face level is where that is. Hydrogen sulfide is going, to, is going to be heavier, and we want to mount it one foot from the floor. Nitrogen dioxide, we want to mount it one to three feet from the ceiling. Oxygen, we want to mount it three to five feet from the floor. Combustibles that are heavier in air, we want to mount one foot from the floor, and combustibles that are lighter than air, we want to mount one foot from the ceiling. And it's interesting to note that hot NO2 from exhaust is lighter than air, so we want to, we want to be sure to mount that closer to the ceiling. Let's talk about calibration and maintenance. Everybody asks, well, how often should I calibrate my sensors? Simply put, the calibration interval, interval is dependent on the environment and other factors unique to each application. There are calibration kits and or procedures that are available for all the sensors. Some actually don't need calibration. Some have replaceable sensors, and some have kits that you run the gas through and flow the gas to the sensor and adjust the uh, potentiometer or, or some adjust on the, on the sensor itself. And not all calibrations require a bottle of gas. But the common question is, how often should I, should I, should I calibrate my sensor? The reality is that most sensors get installed they pass the verification, and that's the last time anyone checks them until they fail. We get that call all the time. So back to the question, how often should a gas tent sensor be calibrated? There are many factors that affect the frequency of calibration, such as, will the data of the sensor need to hold up to legal scrutiny? Is it a critical installation that is likely to affect the health of the building occupant? Does the building owner require them to be calibrated often and how often? 
How harsh is that environment? Were there any events that might have affected the performance of the sensor recently? How long has it been since the last calibration? And what has your experience taught you? What have you learned based on your experience with gas sensors? And, and what have you seen that you feel needs to be done? As you can see, there is not one clear answer. All of these questions are valid, and the more frequently you calibrate the sensor, the more accurate it's going to be. However, calibrating the sensor too often can, can take up more time than necessary and be more costly than, to the building owner or how more costly than you wish to pay for it. The correct answer is whatever is right for you. As a rule of thumb, we usually recommend that you calibrate the sensor once or twice a year, and that would not be too often. There are many good calibration kits available. Typically, each sensor manufacturer offers kits for all of their sensors. Each kit may come with a regulator and the correct, and the correct attachments, tubing, and instructions to correctly calibrate each sensor. There are some sensors who offer lifetime, some manufacturers that offer lifetime calibration through self-adjusting algorithms that keep the sensor zero in spec. Depending on the gas, gas cylinders can come in 17, 58, or 103 liter bottles. You should be able to get a few calibrations from each bottle of gas, but of course that is dependent on how much gas you use for each calibration. And not all sensors are going to require a bottle of gas to calibrate. Some transmitters have replaceable sensors that snap in place, and some come pre-calibrated. Let's look at a few questions as we close our seminar. Can CO, carbon monoxide, be used to measure diesel exhaust? CO, carbon monoxide, is not a good indicator of diesel exhaust. Diesel engines only produce significant amounts of CO under load and not idling. Typically, nitrogen dioxide is used to detect and sense diesel exhaust in parking garages and loading docks. However, there are a few that advocate sensing diesel exhaust using CO2 sensors. According to the EPA, a gallon of diesel fuel has more CO2 emissions than a gallon of gasoline. So it's, it's certainly conceivable that while normal, normal ambient levels of CO2 outdoors is typically 400 parts per million, irregular elevated levels could certainly indicate idling diesels or automotive engines at loading docks or parking garages. What sensors do we use to monitor indoor air quality? CO is typically used to ensure a building gets adequate amount of fresh uh, air introduced to it. However, VOC, however, VOCs are being used to indicate levels of occupancy to control ventilation frequency and duration. Conventional IAQ monitoring indoor air quality is measured the use of a CO2 sensor. That's called demand control ventilation. It's been used that way for a number of years. It is a method of ventilating a building based on building occupancy. The U.S. Department of Energy advocates the use of CO2 to ensure that the least amount of energy is used to ensure that the proper amount of fresh air is flushed throughout the building instead of a fixed rate of ventilation based on maximum occupancy. What that does is it, it cuts down the energy used to move that air. People will produce CO2 at a predictable level, thus CO2 will, track, will close, closely track occupancy. Using a CO2 sensor to control ventilation frequently, frequency and duration helps conserve energy and maintain the health of the building occupant. Well, what's coming in more popularity is VOCs are being used to indicate occupancy levels. One of the keys to indoor environmental quality sensors is the fact that VOCs are as good as an indicator of space occupancy as CO2. That's because a large share of VOCs in an indoor space are generated by humans from our breathing, sweating, our skin, or colognes perfume. The problem with using CO2 alone, it doesn't pick up the smells and odors that are a result of human occupancy, such as the perfumes and the, and the, uh, and the colognes. But by using an indoor, indoor environmental quality sensor, VOCs can be used to control ventilation and save energy. That concludes our, seminar, our webinar for today. But well, I want to sum up and to say that practically no matter what the gas, there is a sensor that can be used to sense and measure it. Um, there's, there's virtually nothing we can't measure um, through one way, explicit or implicitly, to measure a gas. And the proper maintenance and calibration is essential to accurate measure, measurement and operation. And I want to thank you for attending.